Standard Dinner Care for your presentation, joint introduction to international arbitration and enforcement issues has been very informative and enlightening. As the audience have a view on why international arbitration is the preferred means of a dispute resolution compared to court settlement, its process and its enforcement of arbitral award. Um, and now uh, let's proceed to the next session, question and answers. And this uh, session will be conducted in both English and Indonesian. Dan apabila dari para hadirin ada pertanyaan dapat disampaikan dalam bahasa Indonesia ataupun bahasa Inggris. Dipersilahkan untuk tiga pertanyaan, tiga penanya pertama. Ya, uh, Pak, silahkan. Thank you. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you, SIP Law Firm, for hosting this wonderful event and congratulations for many achievements and hope many more to come to Bu Fitri, Bu Ida, Pastri. And thank you for gentlemen for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I just curious from uh, either a board from Derek and Pa Eric, you, you have mentioned about uh, Singapore and also arbitration uh, first. Uh, from your experience, how complicated it will be for the enforcement of uh, foreign arbitration award in Indonesia, especially from SIIC or Singapore-based arbitration? And second, connected to Pa Eric uh, presentation before about uh, Singapore political things and with the flourishing of uh, economy between Indonesia and Singapore, is there any specific political um, negotiation or dealings that Singapore government deal with Indonesia in dealings with arbitration and aside from the BIT uh, is there any regulation that we need to pay attention about business and its connection between Indonesia and Singapore as I aware there's some issue about extradition is there any other things that uh, we need to concern about in dealings between Singapore and Indonesia? The third, this is just uh, curious. I often read about the ex aqua et bono uh, since Derek mentioned about some sophisticated Latin phrases. So it's come up to my memory. And I read that in, as you may aware, that in Indonesia, ex aqua et bono often used in a lot of uh, pleadings and claims and whatever things involving court the lawyers will love to mention ex aqua et bono to the judges and specifically to the arbitration i read that if there is no specific agreement between both parties usually uh, the tribunal cannot grant it the pleadings or the claim um, solely based on uh, ex aqua et bono uh, what is the context and how you explain about uh, this uh, since I don't know this uh, gap in legal culture might well uh, give some problems with our uh, legal proceedings. Uh, thank you and I hope this is not taking much time. Thank you Hannah. Thank you. Uh, we will be first answered. Oh, Mr. Derek. Okay. Sure. I think I'll t answer your first question. Uh, but maybe before I answer your first question, I wish to ask, what do you mean by ex aqua bono? <laughs> I think I believe it's a amiable compositor. And, sorry, uh, Ami uh, uh, Thank you for the explanation, Hannah. Yeah, shows again the gap in <laughs> legal culture. I think the first point uh, that you ask is how easy is it to enforce an SIAC uh, arbitral award in uh, Indonesia? Now, when it comes to enforcement, a lot of the um, complications are actually caused by the particular jurisdiction that you're trying to enforce in. Uh, you know, each ju jurisdiction is different, has different uh, legal culture and all that, and they may set different requirements. So for example, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, uh, in, I think in, in Dubai, I think if you wish to enforce an arbitral award there, you know, 
the award has to be made physically in Dubai, you know. So arbitrators can't be in other jurisdictions. They have to fly to Dubai to sign the arbitral award. So different jurisdictions have different peculiarities, you know, on how to uh, enforce their awards, the, the procedural process to enforce the award. Now, as I understand it from my limited understanding in, of Indonesian law, I understand that in Indonesia, when you wish to enforce an arbitral award, you have to have arbitrators register it, right? Now, this presents a very uh, interesting uh, conundrum from a legal sort of uh, uh, doctrine perspective because uh, in international arbitration, after a tribunal has issued uh, an arbitral award, what happens is that, you know, to use another Latin term, they are functus officio, meaning that the, the tribunal no longer exists after they issue the award, no, it no, no longer exists. Now, for Indonesian law to require that after the award has been uh, issued, you know, for the arbitrators to register it, is a bit of a, a, a contradiction because, you know, under international law and international arbitration laws, you know, the tribunal doesn't, the, the arbitrators don't exist anymore in the legal sense. So, this is, I think, one of the uh, difficulties, perhaps, a procedural difficulty in enforcing uh, arbitral awards uh, uh, in Indonesia. Yeah. Thank you for your question earlier about uh, what you mentioned as whether there are any political you know, uh, oh, developments right, between Singapore and Indonesia to be of note. You mentioned about the extradition treaty. In fact, you may be interested to know that in January this year, our respective governments actually signed an expanded framework that covered three things. The agreement on the realignment of the boundary between the Jakarta Flight Information Region, that's the FIR, and there's the Treaty for the Extradition of Fugitives, and that's the ET we call it, and also there's a joint statement between the Defence Ministers on the 2007 Defence Cooperation Agreement the DCA. So three of these agreements were signed like a pack of sorts. And the FIR itself was actually ratified, I think, by Indonesia earlier this month, leaving the other two, All right, which is the extradition treaty and the joint statement on the, on the DCA, the Defence Cooperation Agreement. I think this will be a matter of time before the ratification will happen. I would like to think that Singapore and Indonesia enjoy very good and close ties. Eh? So these are issues which I think over the years have been worked out. Uh, in fact, I, I think I can disclose without offending our official secret sec. I was one of the members in, involved in the initial uh, negotiations for the treaty for the extradition of fugitives. So we were aware of you know, the difficulties and all that. But uh, I think after that, things were ironed out very well. So I think it's just a matter of time waiting for these, you know, respective uh, agreements to be ratified. I think once the DCA is finalized, it will strengthen the cooperation between our armed forces and also advance, I think, our bilateral defense re relations. As for the extradition, extradition treaty, I think it will go a long way to help in law enforcement and promoting rule of law, right, for, I think, both countries. So that, I think, relates to your part of the question about the political aspects eh, on, on some of these agreements. Now, other agreements to be taken note of, you've rightly mentioned the Bilateral Investment Treaty. And earlier on, I mentioned about the Double Taxation Agreement. So these, I think, are the key uh, agreements we've seen over the last one, two years. I'm not aware of any new ones uh, in terms of, say, arbitration uh, that you mentioned that's coming up. But there is something called the Singapore Convention on Mediation. I don't know whether you know, you're aware of that. So that is also an international treaty. I think um, so far, a couple of countries have actually signed and a few have ratified. I think Indonesia has not you know, been signed up on, on the particular agreement. Perhaps that can be an area to look forward to huh? because mediation really does help from our own experience doing disputes. It is very helpful in preserving parties' relations preserving confidentiality, etc. So I think that is an area perhaps, you know, we can work towards having Indonesia on board. And I think that will serve the interests of, you know, both sides uh, going forward when we have cases of this nature. Uh, just to answer the last question they had about the exequate de bono, I understand from Hannah that, you know, this is a relief that's just in, in Indonesian proceedings that's always, you know, included. And I guess your gist of question is, is there something sort of similar in, in international arbitration that parties always know, like, uh, uh, included uh, 
uh, regardless. I mean, we have our version in Singapore as well. You know, whenever we uh, make in court litigation, we say we include any other reliefs that you know the court <laughs> uh, thinks that it should order. And in in international arbitration itself, um, I don't necessarily see something like this as being thrown in all the time. But when it comes to setting aside of an arbitral award or resisting enforcement of it, like I mentioned, breach of natural justice. You know, has always is always used when you try to set aside or to refuse uh, enforcement of an arbitral award. You know, whether there is grounds for it or not, we will use it. And another one that's often used is to say that there are public policy issues. Oh, there's corruption, or this particular dispute cannot be arbitrated under uh, you know the particular governing law. Those are always used, and the I think the the issue is that. We find ourselves, you know, in many of these cases, you know, really scraping the bottom of the barrel. We're just desperately trying to, you know, set aside or resist enforcement of the award. So, we try to come up with, you know, various creative arguments to try and set it aside. For example, in the uh, uh, earlier case I mentioned in uh, PT uh, uh, Garuda, Indonesia, uh, you know, they try to use the very creative, you know, uh, argument that, you know, the the seat is actually Singapore because arbitration was held. Here, you know, this is you know is an attempt. You know, I don't think that PT Indonesia Garuda really uh, mixed up. You know, the difference between a venue and a seat. But I think that it's just an attempt to try and set it aside. You know, in Singapore. But you know, perhaps they think that they don't have a chance of setting it aside in Jakarta. So they're just trying their luck to try and get it uh, under Singapore's uh, jurisdiction. I think. Maybe another Indonesian case that sort of comes to my mind is uh, again a state-owned entity. Again, uh, in Singapore courts, it's I believe it's PT Asuransi Jasa Indonesia Persero, uh, a state-owned entity in Indonesia uh, against uh, one of their creditors, uh, Dexia Bank SA. So what happened in this case was that they, uh, the state-owned entity uh, PT Asuransi. They issued a certain structured debt uh, uh, notes, which were supposed to mature, you know, after a certain term. And the respondent was a holder of these uh, structured notes. And what happened was that there was a dispute, you know, about when these notes were to uh, be mature. And the respondent in this case, you know, uh, uh, went to arbitration against uh, PT Asuransi. They they had this arbitration. And what happened was that PT Asuransi chose not to participate in this arbitration, which I think is really a big mistake, you know, because I think PT Asuransi in that case felt that uh, you know they they were in the right, you know, and so they decided not to uh, participate in the arbitration. And eventually, what happened was that they properly restructured the notes, and you know, all the note holders were actually happy about it. But the problem is that because they chose not to participate in the arbitration, the Arbitral Tribunal itself was not aware, you know, that this restructuring had occurred, and so they made their decision, you know, based on the facts that were presented by one side, by the respondent uh, itself, and you know, by failing to, you know, participate in it, you know, what happened was that it involved. What 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 happened after that was that two, you know, court litigations in Jakarta were taken out, and a second arbitration was started by, you know, a PT Asuransi, you know, uh, and. You know, they found that uh, it was in uh, uh, the second tribunal that was constituted uh, for this second arbitration created by PT Asuransi. They found that it was a breach of uh, an abuse of process. So, you know, the the long point that I'm trying to get to is that another element of it is that sometimes parties want to have a second bite at the cherry. You know, if the first arbitration fails, I'm going to start a second one against uh, you know this uh, uh, a respondent and to try new arguments. But you know this is considered a, a abuse of process. And in this case, the second uh, arbitration uh, tribunal they found that PT Ashuransi what they were doing you know in trying to argue new arguments was that it's um, uh, it's uh, an abuse of process. You know, and they said that you know if you wanted to raise these arguments, what you should have done is to participate in the first arbitration. Never mind, you know your moral objections to it, and you think that you were in the right. But at least you know participate in, in it because. A lot of money could have been saved if they had participated in it, and let the tribunal know that hey, we're going to do this restructuring, and all the note holders are very happy with it. Then you know, they would have saved so much money. They wouldn't have had to start two litigations in Jakarta. They wouldn't have to start the second arbitration, and they wouldn't have to start the, this line in the Singapore courts to try and set aside the the, the first arbitral award. And and so, you know, I think another issue that. Happens very often is that uh, you know we try to have a second bite at the cherry when we 
uh, you know, take the stance of not participating at all. So my advice in this regard is that even though there's an arbitration, you know, taken out against you and you feel that you've not done anything wrong, you know, you shouldn't boycott the arbitration. You should at least participate in it and, you know, participate in it and you, you could still, like I mentioned earlier, retain that ace up your sleeve, you know, that, uh, that the tribunal does not have jurisdiction. You know, keep it to, to your chest, you know, and, you know, if they, you see through it to the end of arbitration, what happens, they try to enforce it, you bring that out, you know, to try and resist enforcement of it, rather than to have a second bite at the cherry, you know, by starting a new arbitration and, and really a, an abuse of process. Yeah, thank you.